Good morning. It's good to be with you this day, and I am Rob Espinoza. Uh, of course, I'm not Terry Cyber. Terry is here today, but Terry's uh, still recovering from his recent surgery. So Terry asked me if I would bring a lesson today just so he can have a little more time to uh, rest and recover from uh, what he's de dealing with with the surgery he just had. And plus, I know he has a uh, shoulder that's also bothering him that he wants to get that taken care of. So I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today and bring a lesson from God's Word. I'd like to, as I start the lesson today, I just want to play a short part of a, of a song because the sermon title is based on a title of a song that I, I like very much. So just listen for a moment and then we'll continue on from there. wanted to play a part of that song. I'm actually going to read the lyrics uh, completely. Of course, the title of today's lesson, as you can get from the song there, is Humble and Kind. And of course, it's a title of a song that was written and performed by a country artist named Tim McGraw. If you're, if you're a country music fan, you probably know Tim McGraw pretty well. He's one of my favorites, and that is one of my very favorite songs that I've ever heard. And, you know, Terry's been preaching for a while now on the fruit of the Spirit. And of course, both humble, hum humility and kindness are both attributes of fruit of the Spirit. So this kind of goes along with what we've been studying for a while now. Uh, when Terry contacted me on Friday and asked me if I could preach, I, I've had this in the back of my mind for a while that I'd like to share a sermon on this. So I pulled some information together, and I borrowed some material on humility from Brother Mike Mazzalongo in a, in a, in a sermon he did, not specifically on humility, but uh, it, it included a, a lot of things on humility. And I also borrowed some material from Brother uh, Titus West, on the topic of kindness. So let me go ahead and uh, read the full lyrics for the song Humble and Kind. The lyrics go as this, you know there's a light that glows by the front door. Don't forget the keys under the mat. When childhood stars shine, always stay humble and kind. Go to church because your mama says to. Visit Grandpa every chance that you can. It won't be wasted time. Always stay humble and kind. Hold the door, say please, say thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, and don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but always stay humble and kind. When the dreams you're dreaming come to you, when the work you put in is realized, let yourself feel the pride, but always stay humble and kind. Don't expect a free ride from no one. Don't hold a grudge or a chip, and here's why. Bitterness keeps you from flying. Always stay humble and kind. Know the difference between sleeping with someone and sleeping with someone you love. I love you ain't no pickup line, so always stay humble and kind. 
Hold the door, say please, say thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, and don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but always stay humble and kind. When those dreams you're dreaming come to you, when the work you put in is realized, let yourself feel the pride, but always stay humble and kind. When it's hot, eat a root beer popsicle. Shut off the AC and roll the windows down. Let that summer sun shine. Always stay humble and kind. Don't take for granted the love this life, this life gives you. When you get where you're going, don't forget to turn back around and help the next one in line. Always stay humble and kind. I think there's a lot of good thoughts in those lyrics and things that we can apply in our lives. So today, as we talk about humility and kindness, I first of all like to talk about why we should be humble. And then I'm going to talk in detail about a character we find in the Bible, a great man we find in the Bible, and what he did and what he went through and how he was so humble. And then we'll talk about how we can do things to be humble in our lives. And then of course we want to talk and touch on the topic of being kind or kindness for a short while. And I know that Terry preached on the topic of grace goes to the humble earlier in this year in May, and I think this will hopefully complement the lesson, the sermon that Terry shared with us then. So as we begin today, I'd like to share a little bit of humor with you. Think about this. Growing up really humbles you. I've always dreamed of a big fancy sports car, but now I'm just okay with whichever runs me over. So let's talk for a moment about why we should be humble. First of all, it's because we can control this and nothing else. And this is a task that God gives us to do. We need to swallow our pride. We need to lower ourselves. We need to subject ourselves to our Father in heaven. We need to be humble before others. And listen close, we need to each accept our limits and also acknowledge our sins and our failures. We control this part of our life, and God controls all the rest. That things grow, multiply, go well, develop, move forward, go up. All the details behind these things are in God's control. He says yes or no, up or down, not us. Oh yeah, we, we work at these things, we plan, we execute, we study, etc. But the final results are in God's hands. God provides great success. God blesses those who humble themselves before him. And who doesn't want to have success? I think there wouldn't be a person here that doesn't want to be successful. They don't want to be great at something. But the thing we've had to first be great at, friends and brethren, is being a child of God and doing God's will. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, we're told there, God is opposed to the proud, but as Terry's lesson said, gives grace to the humble. And therein lies the key to greatness in the kingdom, those who humble themselves. God will make a person great, but you first have to be willing to humble yourself. There's perfect symmetry and balance. We control the humbling part, and God controls the great part. As we lower ourselves in humility, he raises us in spiritual greatness. 
and no other system works, no other method gets results, and you can't force God to make you great in any other way. And that is why humility is the pathway to spiritual greatness. It is the only thing in our control. And it's the only thing of value, including our faith, that we have to offer to God. So let's talk for a few minutes about a man we find in the Bible who we're all very familiar with. You know, we can see in God's word that we are given instruction to those who may want to be great or the greatest in the kingdom. And, you know, this is a, a natural desire that every person would have. But the path to greatness, as it's explained to us, lays in a person's intimate knowledge and understanding of humility. You see, in the world, people who aspire to greatness, they study the subject of greatness, the manners of great people, and the heights that the great ones reach. But our Lord and Savior Jesus, he reversed this idea, and he taught his followers, especially those who aspire to greatness. And there were several, Peter and John and Paul, to name a few. Jesus taught them that the way to achieve greatness was to cultivate the virtue of humility. He said, this because, he said this because it was things that humility produced in a person's character that determined who was spiritually great and greater and the greatest in the kingdom of God. And in order to give you an example of this in someone's life, I'd like to focus for a little while on Moses and his journey to spiritual greatness. Perhaps his experience can guide all of those who may yearn for the ability to be greater spiritually than they are currently at this moment. So let's talk about, first of all, Moses' attempt at greatness. Now, if there is anyone among God's people who was prepared by the world for greatness, it was Moses. His efforts failed as both the Jewish and Egyptian people turned against him, and he had to flee into the desert for safety. You think about it, he spent 40 years in the desert tending sheep and raising a family in a simple lifestyle. Before God would then call him to lead his people out of Egyptian slavery. So we can talk about Moses' spiritual greatness. We're all familiar with Moses' experience, experience leading God's people in the wilderness for 40 years. And during that time, Moses exercised judgment over the people. He taught them. He interceded with God on their behalf. He led them from camp. He fought wars and spent many a lonely night in fasting and prayer. And the wilderness period saw many high points where Moses led the people to build a tabernacle and begin formal worship. But also there were low points where God punished the people, even Moses himself, for their disobedience. And all of this culminates in Numbers chapter 27 verses 12 through 23 when the Lord informs Moses of two great events which were, are to take place in his life in the near future. The first was that Moses will get to actually see the promised land, but will not be able to go there with the people. And the second was Moses was about to die in a short period of time. But what's interesting about this announcement is Moses' reaction to it. His first impulse was not to argue or mourn about his impending death. Even though the Bible tells us and says that he was perfectly healthy at the time. Moses' first impulse 
was to ask God to provide a good leader to take his place and continue the work that he had been doing. You know, this reaction on Moses' part reveals the great change in his character from the days when he aspired to greatness using his own strength and wisdom. And at the eve of uh, the demise of Moses, uh, his great humility and thus his spiritual greatness, it shined through and demonstrates the character of those who are great in God's kingdom. Let's talk for a moment, and for example, we can see that Moses had very little to no self-will. In Numbers chapter 27, verses 12 through 14, we're told there, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain in the Abiram range, and see the land I have given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people, as your brother Aaron was. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. So Moses truly was without self-will after decades of searching, finding, and doing God's will in every kind of situation. Moses accepted God's will without hesitation, without questioning why. Is not his will and rationale for how things should be, but it was God's will, even in life or death situations, and especially in life or death situations. We need to also realize that Moses was focused on God's purpose and not his own. Also in Numbers chapter 27, beginning in verse 15 through 17, Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. You know, notice that his concern was for the people's welfare and not his own. God's purpose and plan was bound up in the people of Israel. They were the ones through whom the Messiah would eventually come. But Moses was secure enough in God's love that he could, even at a critical moment in his life, stay focused on what was important. Not to him, but what was important to God. He could see the impact that his death would have on the people that he had led for so long. Moses remained centered on what God had given him to do even when the temptation was great to shift his attention to himself. So think about this, brethren and friends. Those who aspire to spiritual greatness, they must be able to remain focused on God and his purpose, even when there are storms of trials and temptations all around. Think about this also. Think about the power that Moses had. In Numbers chapter 27, <clears throat> verses 18 through 23. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eliezer the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eliezer the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eliezer the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord instructed through Moses. So notice here that Moses prepares, anoints, and instructs Joshua, his successor. In the boldness of this book, and the next book of Deuteronomy, Moses provides the people with instructions on worship, how they should conduct themselves, and their future. 
We note especially in these passages that the people readily accepted his leadership and his teaching because of the power that he had. And if you read in the entire book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, you will see that Moses' power was based on his humility. For example, he did not fight anyone for his position, even though he was often challenged. He did not debate or scheme to keep his position. On the contrary, he was constantly pleading with God on his knees on behalf of his people even when they attacked him. And you see Moses' complete lack of effort to control or rule or win over the people, coupled with his total dependence on God, provided him with the power that he needed to rule. So think about this. When God's leaders become tired, many times it's because they're relying too much on their own strength and not enough on God's. And Moses shows us that when God's leaders humble themselves before God and others, God raises them up and he empowers them to lead, whether it be nations, families, or churches. You know, the Bible shows that Moses was Israel's greatest leader. And it tells us he was also the humblest man on earth in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3. The greatest leader and the most humble. What does this tell us? It tells me that the key to success in the kingdom of God is simply humility, being humble. And if we, any of us, want to be great or do great things in the kingdom of, of God, you must begin by cultivating the virtue of humility. So let's talk about how we can be humble, how we can have this trait of humility in our lives. So how do we cultivate this virtue of humility? How do we become humble? It's a good question. And it's also a tricky thing because just talking about being humble or developing humility smacks of pride and boastfulness, doesn't it? But simply looking at Moses' life does help us understand the process. And I believe Moses' vision or insight in two areas continually nurtured his humble attitude. That first area was Moses' vision of himself. Of course, Moses knew himself well. He knew his own history, his own character, his own weakness and, and sins. He knew the depths of his sinful nature in remembering that he had killed a man. He knew his own weakness and acknowledged these to God when God anointed, wanted him to be a leader and spokesman to the people. And he knew the depravity of human nature as a leader of millions who had to settle through the true person he was without any denial or rationalizations. But the second area was that Moses knew God. You know, from the early teachings of his mother to the burning bush, from the awesome miracles to freeing the Jews from Egypt, to the many face-to-face -face encounters with God on the mountain. Moses knew God better and more intimately than any man of his previous generation. His knowledge of God was firsthand and personal, not just theoretically or from hearsay. But the point here, brethren and friends, is that when Moses compared the two visions of his weak, weak sinful self and that of the holy, mighty God, this produced humility in him that seeped through his character and all of his dealings with other people. You know, I know that each of us, many people, would like a list, you know, um, 10 things to do to become more humble, or the top three exercises to create humility. But it doesn't work that way. Humility is the product of discovery. As we discover our true selves, 
and the true God, a sense of humility overtakes us and grows as we, as we deepen and broaden our knowledge of these two areas. So maybe we can look at a few things as we, as we close this part of the lesson on humility. We can suggest a few things that we may be able to do that will help to put us on the path of discovery of humility in our lives. The first is that we could set aside a specific time each day to read God's word and to pray to God. You know, pushing aside the world in our own activities for God, that itself is an act of humility. We can also begin asking God for different things in our prayer life. You know, instead of asking for things like happiness or health or peace, etc., why don't we ask God to reveal the real, our real self to us? And this, I'm sure, will be a humbling experience for everyone. And then the third thing, we can try doing the thing that God wants us to do. You know, it's different for each of us, but in every life, there's something that God wants of us. Try to figure out what that is and begin making that the focus of your life for a change. And this could become the first step in lowering yourself before God so that he can ultimately lift you up in spiritual greatness. Well now, that concludes the, the part of the lesson on humility. But now I want to talk for a few minutes about kindness. Let me share uh, a fact with you, a fun fact about kindness. Acts of kindness provide benefits beyond creating a, a better society. When we act kindly, the brain releases endorphins, which trigger a positive feeling and pain reduction similar to that of morphine. And I'm sure I know a lot of us here would like to reduce pain. So the bottom line is, let's be kind. We talk about kindness, you know, one thing that gives people great joy is showing the love of God and his son Jesus to those who are lost in the world. The gentleman here, Titus West, he gives an account where he remembered helping a gentleman who was homeless and not a Christian. And, and he... It, the man told him something as they parted away. The homeless man said something to Titus as they were parting ways. And he said to him, it was nice to be treated like a human being. What a simple and, you know, just a simple thing is to treat someone like a human, human being makes such a big difference. In a Wednesday teen class that... Titus is involved in, they had been learning a simple yet powerful statement, which was, if I believe God made me in his image, I must believe that he created others in his image as well. Well, the goal here is to learn to love other people, even those who do not believe as we do, with the love of the Lord. You know, it's funny that, because I, 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 it's something I pray for every day is that God will give me the love of Jesus, the love of the Lord. And it's important that we do that so we can sh try to love other people the same way Jesus did. But it's hard to just start loving people, though. So how do we start doing that? Well, we can fi find that we, the way to love all people begins with learning to be kind to all people. But there's a big difference between how the Bible and our culture defines kindness. As we know, kindness is a fruit of the Spirit, from Galatians 5, verse 22, which is defined in this way from the Greek Christotis. Useful moral excellence of character or demeanor, outward behavior, gracious, gentle, goodness, and kindness. But however, in our culture that we live in today, kindness means endorsing one's behavior. 
So the Bible gives a definition of how to be kind, and our culture says blind, uh, kindness is blind acceptance of one's behavior. Can you see the difference? In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 17, we're told there, a man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. And Paul tells Titus in chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, that it is because of the goodness and kindness of God that he saved us through Christ. And it's not because we are righteous, but it is one of the beautiful character traits of a loving God. The goal in being kind to all people is that it's a quality of God that we can develop, we can envelop, and we can show to others. When we are kind to all people, they can see God. You know, of course, kindness isn't just a benefit to others. In Proverbs 21 and verse 21, we're told there, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. <clears throat> Think about this for a moment. Kindness makes life more enjoyable for those who give it out. You know, one cannot practice kindness with malice on their heart. Therefore, kindness will always leave one with a clear conscience. Can you think of a time when you may have practiced kindness and it wasn't filled with joy? Kindness benefits the one practicing it as well. So as we go into the world this week, as we go forward from this place today, I challenge each of us to look for the lost and show them the character trait of God that brought him to compassion to save you and me. Maybe we can just play a small part in saving a soul just by being kind to others. So, we all can agree that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the greatest in the kingdom. He's the greatest example we would ever have because he emptied himself completely and accepted God will, God's will in death to save each and every one of us. And now he sits in the greatest position at the right hand of God. You know, I think it's, it's no accident that our first step in discipleship, our first entry into the kingdom, is when we lower ourselves into the waters of baptism and return clean, pure, and eternal. So if this is God's will for you, that you want to be a child of God, you want to be a, a member of, of God's family, then I would encourage you to humble yourselves today so that, you could, that God can raise you up in glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you and may God bless you all.